Welcome or welcome back to Spellbound. I'm Beige and these are five of the best books that I read in February. Okay, and we're coming in hot with Brother by Anaya Alborn, published 2015 by Gallery Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Okay, so this is a horror novel that was gripping, disturbing, and suspenseful as hell. So this story follows a family of serial killers in Appalachia in the 80s. They're dirt poor and they have an incredibly dysfunctional family dynamic, as you can imagine. But the ringleader, like the murderous ringleader of this serial killing family is actually the mother. There are four kids, two girls and two boys, and there are dual POVs uh, in this story from the perspectives of both brothers. But the protagonist of this book is the youngest brother, Michael. So Michael really hates the disturbing activities that the family sort of gets up to. Um, he doesn't want any part of it at all. He hates the screaming. He hates like everything. Um, but he does have a responsibility to participate and his key role is kind of an after the fact sort of role. Michael is responsible for preserving the meat in the family's freezer for the mother to later use and serve. Oh yeah. This book is gritty as hell, um, but fortunately it's not very graphic. So it is gory because it's about serial killers, but not in an overly gratuitous way. A thousand percent, the point of this book and the nitty gritty comes from the extremely tense and volatile relationships between everyone in the family. So we follow Michael as he starts to grow up a little bit. I think he's around 16 and he starts to get a little more freedom and responsibility within the family. So he starts being able to go along in car rides with Rebel as they take the family's one truck out on errands or to scout for victims or what have you. But as the story goes on, you start to see flashbacks from Rebel's point of view and from how Michael came in to be a part of the family and how that has affected Rebel. And as the story goes on, you start to see this story sort of unravel in front of you that gets more and more tense and disturbing with every chapter and you realize that you're witnessing a completely psychotic revenge story that has been simmering for a very long time. The suspense in this book is absolutely top-notch. You start the book sort of like on the wrong foot and spend the rest of the story trying to write yourself, but there is not a moment's peace in the entire book. So because of that, it definitely has elements of like a suspense or a thriller, but this book is 100% horror. Like this book is horrific. It is terrifying. It is gory. It is scary. Um, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> if you like those things, you'll like this book. Good storytelling, terrifying story. Every Heart a Doorway by Shannon McGuire, published 2016 by Tor.com Publishing. So this is the first novella of a very popular speculative fiction novella series called the Wayward Children series. And it follows children who have stepped into portals into other worlds. And sometimes these worlds are like well-known literary worlds, you know, nonsense worlds, sort of wonderland type of worlds. But sometimes they're just completely made up worlds that aren't famous or literary. But this series is about what happens to these children if they ever come back into our world after entering through a portal to another world. So it's about what it's like when they come back and I'm trying to assimilate to sort of this world. So most of the time, these kids have been gone anywhere from like weeks to months, even though to the children, it may feel and usually feels like years or even a lifetime. The point is these kids don't want to be back because the reason that they were able to find a portal into another world anyway is that their soul was searching for it. So these worlds that they found themselves in for however long were uniquely tailored to be a world where that child, that girl usually would thrive and would really be able to be themselves. So the whole point is that these children who have stumbled back into our world don't want to be here. They 
always want to go back to their other worlds. But really this school is just a school for children who acknowledges the portals that they've been to and helps them cope with the reality that they may never find their door again, they may never find their doorway, but never really losing hope. So that's kind of what this school is about, that's the premise. So the main plot of this novella as the first book in this series is that a new girl shows up at this school for wayward children. She's coming from a sort of dark vampire world and she's kind of gothic I guess and so she's kind of immediately misunderstood even in a school of misunderstood kids and so as soon as she shows up also there's like a series of pretty grisly murders and these students start being killed so she's got a lot of the spotlight on her and everyone wants to know if she's the killer um but this is not a murder mystery whodunit kind of book that's just the plot of what's happening at this school as soon as she shows up it's a pretty intriguing storyline to be honest to introduce this very unique concept I loved this little book and I can't wait to continue with this series. It's so literary, it's so whimsical and melancholy, which is always such a beautiful combination. I loved it and it's definitely a love letter to readers and a book for people who love books and stories. They Both Die in the End by Adam Silvera, published 2017 by Quill Tree Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. So this one is kind of like an LGBTQ plus YA staple at the moment. It is a speculative YA fiction and part of the death cast duology. Essentially, in this speculative world, on the day that you're going to die, you receive a call from death cast. They're just there to alert you that at some point over the next 24 hours, you're going to die. Uh, they don't know when and they don't know how, they just let you know. So naturally, because this takes place in our world, the entire idea of your last day has been totally capitalized and commercialized. So there are a lot of these like last day experiences that you can take part in as a decker. Uh, that's what you're called whenever you receive the call, you're like on deck. So you're called a Decker. A lot of augmented and virtual reality experiences around the world in 80 minutes kind of things. And there's even entirely unique social media platforms that are dedicated to Deckers. There are like Deckers only blogs and vlogs so that people can like follow Deckers on their last day and see how they live it up. And there's also one called Last Friend. And this is where you can sign up as a Decker or sign up as a not Decker to be paired with a, a friend to spend your last day with. So kind of morbid, but that's the, that's the premise. Uh, you understand from the title. So this book follows two teenage boys, like 18 and 19, I think, and they both get the call from Deathcast. One is a very shy and introverted boy who is already dealing with a little bit of tragedy because his father's in a coma, and the other guy is a foster kid who is currently beating up another guy over a girl when he gets the call from Deathcast. So they both meet on Last Friend and decide to spend the day together. So this book was good in that very indulgent tragedy kind of way. So this book is quite obviously very death centric. And so because the entire book is about confronting mortality, there's a lot of mortality to confront and not just regular death either, but like extraordinarily tragic and sad death which again, I'm not criticizing. It serves a purpose and it's written really well to serve that purpose. Um, so no criticism. It just, the amount of it added up to an overall tone that I didn't enjoy personally with what I like to read now. But again, as a YA, I would have loved this book because of the amount of death and mortality confronting content that is in this book. And that's fine because again, this is YA. And so I totally understand why this is such a popular book within YA and within the LGBTQ spheres because like when I was reading contemporary YA, as a YA, this is exactly the type of book that I would have loved because it would have absolutely made me feel seen during a time that I, you know, felt alone. You know, like all queer teenagers, but also as a queer teenager. So this book, in addition to having plenty of themes of death, also has a lot of themes of like coming out and being proud to be who you are and also what it's like to feel seen when you finally do. And so it is heartwarming in that way. It is just also overwhelmingly and consistently sad. 
but I do recommend it. If you, if you like sad books, this is for you. The Glass Witch by Lindsay Puckett, published 2022 by Scholastic Press. This book was cute. It's a little middle grade novel about an adorably plump little witch named Adelaide Good, who has to move back to her mother's hometown of Cranberry Hollow in the Northeast while her mom takes a three month job in Seattle. The thing is, all good women are witches, even Addie. Uh, she just hasn't figured out her magic yet and she believes that it's because of the curse. So like a couple hundred years ago, there was a curse put on all of the good women that said that there can never be more than three at once within the town limits of Cranberry Hollow. So whenever Addie's mom got unexpectedly pregnant with her, she had to leave her mother and her sister behind to raise Addie on her own. So Addie coming back ignites plenty of tension between the good women, not to mention that she's being dropped off on Halloween night when the entire town of Cranberry Hollow celebrates with a festival and a pageant. So during the festival, Addie does something dramatic and has to team up with a brand new friend and some bunny familiars to fix it. So like I said, this book was cute. It is a light, fluffy middle grade. It is not overly long and it's not like trying to be this ne next epic fantasy. You know, it was exactly as long as it needed to be and the pacing was good. The premise I thought was, was pretty cute and intriguing and what helps make it intriguing is the narration of our main character, Addie. Um, it's very fun being in her head. The entire atmosphere was like very Salem inspired, kind of whimsical, eerie, and those all like that worked with Addie's narration really well. It worked with the premise and it sort of built this very, very neat idea. Unfortunately, the narrative overall, like the story, the beginning, middle, and end, didn't really feel substantive enough to carry it all the way through to the end, especially with the climax. There were several hits to the tension um, that had been building throughout the story that just kind of lost our momentum, and the climax overall didn't seem to match the intensity of the rising actions that had taken place to get us there. Like overall, the climax to me just felt too easy for our main characters. And that was that was pretty disappointing because I was really in it in the beginning. I was really in it with, with Addie and her friends. So I was kind of disappointed by that. It, it's still cute and light, but I think this story could have used some heavier impact in the climax. But speaking of characters, that's what made this book great. I loved these characters. So Addie was really fun. It was fun to be in her head, but like almost immediately she, when she gets to Cranberry Hollow, she makes like an instant BFF uh, and her name is Fatima and she is like the best. She is immediately kind and welcoming to Addie. She is fun and exciting. She's passionate about Halloween and monsters, which like it was really fun to see, but also her Muslim background and identity was such a huge part of her character that we could really see how it played into the way that she thought about things, the way that she approached things, and also how she participated in the story. It was so much fun to read about. She, to me, was like a scene stealer for even Addie um, in every scene that she was in. And I would 100% read an entire book about Fatima. Like, I wanna know what she's up to now. So the characters were super lovable, and I think that that was the best part of this book. And finally, The Bone Witch by Ren Chepeco, published 2017 by Sourcebooks Fire, an imprint of Sourcebooks. Oh my gosh, this book. This book. So I absolutely love this book and this book series, and I'm going to try to explain it as best as as clearly as I can because I'm currently so obsessed with it, like I'm in the middle of, of an obsession with it, which kind of just makes me go on tangents. So I'm gonna try and be succinct and clear, um, but I am currently in like 30% of the way through the third book at the time of filming this. So here I go. This book is basically, not basically, it's not basic at all. It's very complicated. Um, this book is essentially about geisha warriors plus magic plus necromancy. So hear me out. It's, it's also kind of a tall order for me, not just because I'm currently obsessed with it, but because that this book is kind of hard to pin down. And I don't mean that in like, you have no idea as a reader what's going on, like you totally do. But by putting such clear words around it, you're almost sort of diminishing the ethereal storytelling and the amount of story that comes from the context. The narrative is ultimately 
born from the incredibly thick world building and from the context of that. So I am going to like tell you what the book is about. I just don't want to diminish the experience of sort of figuring it out through the context of the world because that's how this book is meant to be experienced, I think. So like I said, this book is about geisha warriors plus magic plus necromancy, but none of those words are in any of the books. That's because everything that we learn about this world is so controlled and ethereal, like through world building, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so let me put some more words around it. <laughs> so the entire thing is told through flashback and at the beginning and end of each chapter, we see what's happening present day. Present day, we are following a bard who has wandered down to like this absolutely depressing and decrepit beach that feels like it's like on the edge of the world. And there are these skeletons and bones of an enormous bones of these absolutely massive, like Titan sized monsters called Deva. There on this very, hopeless beach, he meets this woman who has been exiled. And so this woman is telling him her story through flashback of how she came to be exiled. But the flashbacks that the woman is telling the bard is about her origin story and how she started out on her journey when she first had her heart's glass drawn. So this happens when a child comes of age and an Asha comes to the village and draws the children's heart's glass. And their heart is literally drawn into heart's glass that they wear around their necks for like the rest of their lives. Most people's hearts glass are red with like flickers of different colors that denote different emotions or different things. Um, if you have purple hearts glass, that denotes some smaller magic abilities. But if you have silver hearts glass, then that means that you have very strong magical abilities and you're taken to be trained as an Asha if you're a woman or a death seeker if you're a man. Now I mentioned that Asha are, are magic and they have silver hearts glass, so they have like strong magical abilities. For them, they use this in their, sometimes in their arts, but usually in the fighting, um, like wind, they use wind rooms, wind summoning, water summoning, fire summoning, those types of things. Um, so kind of like the elements, right? Very avatar. But the rarest type of Asha can use death runes and this can they can speak to and actually raise the dead. An Asha that has this power is called a bone witch. Bone witches are incredibly rare, but bone witches are incredibly rare because it is incredibly dangerous to do this, not just for the obvious reasons, but also in order to raise a creature from the dead or a person from the dead, you have to sort of share space in your mind with them. And so bone witches are constantly at risk of the dark rot, which is when the more that you give up your mind, uh, to share mind space with the deceased, um, the darkness can like creep in. It can, you can see it in the person's heart glass of how much the darkness is sort of coming over them. And that happens to their minds as well. So many other bone witches have been killed by the Ashaka plus their country's government uh, for this reason. But in a kingdom where undead monsters are a constant threat, only bone witches can kill them or control them. The first book in this series spans a couple of years and follows our main character, Tia, as she discovers that she is a bone witch by accidentally raising her own brother from the dead and um, how she's trained to be an Asha and then slowly uncovers a massive plot that affects several kingdoms. And as she's telling the story or in between, every time that we check in sort of present day with the bard, you see her sort of mixing and drinking these potions and she's resurrecting these enormous dead monsters. And they're still sort of dead when they're brought back to life. Um, so you kind of start to realize at the end she's been exiled for a reason and is she the villain and then you kind of realize oh shit she's building an army this book will not spoon feed you in the way that other more contemporary accessible YA fantasy might so i would put the world building and the writing of this book more closely aligned with adult fantasy, like something more akin to Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo, um, just because of how thick 
the world building is, but it does not so much line up with what you would expect from a current YA fantasy plot now. And this book is also kind of difficult to find your footing in. You may stumble through this book a little bit in trying to understand what's going on, but you're never adrift out at sea. You're never just like, I have no idea what's happening. You do have to put the context together in order to get the context clues to understand what's happening. To me, that is a sign of a really, really controlled use of narrative through world building. I think it's incredible. I, you're, you're never really unsure of what's happening, but you're not really sure how to describe it to someone else. And I think that that's pretty epic. I think that that is a good indicator of really good high fantasy. You know, I don't want it to be similar to something that I can explain in two seconds. I want it to be so confusing that I wouldn't know how to explain it to someone else because it relies on the context of the world. It is a good partnership of thick world building and good storytelling. So obviously I love this book and this trilogy so so much. It is one of my favorite series of all time and I'm loving the experience of rereading it. Like you always know that I think a book is amazing if I read it all in one sitting or if I take like a week or more to read it because I just want to sit and process every single paragraph. Um, and that's what I've been doing with this book. It's taken me like almost three weeks to read this entire trilogy and I'm okay with that. It's just, it's dense. It's good. I highly recommend it obviously, but I do think it's, it's important to know what the reading experience is going to be like before going in because I don't want you to go in expecting a 2023 YA fantasy, expect a 2016 YA fantasy and you'll get it or expect an, a current 2023 adult fantasy and that's more akin to what you're going to get. Epic world building. I love this. I love this book series. So have you read any of these books and are you as obsessed with Ren Chepeko as I uh, clearly seem to be? <laughs> um, and if not, have you read any five-star books lately? Uh, let me know below. And if you made it to the end of this video, then leave a skull emoji because I think that can apply to a couple of the books on this list and either way, we love a skull. And thanks so much for sticking around. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you loved it, hit subscribe. And as always, happy reading. <laughs>